right, we'll reconvene our Board of Education meeting for December the 12th, 2017. We finally have an audience. <laughs> we actually started at 2 o'clock and got, uh, got through with some uh, closed session items, but welcome to your December meeting. Uh, Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays to everyone. Uh, I wish your families and yourself a blessed Christmas, and we appreciate you coming to your Johnston County Public Schools Board meeting. Uh, we've got a couple agenda items we'll take care of, and then we'll get to the fun stuff with student and teacher recognition. Um, board, the approval of the minutes for November the 14th, 2017. You've had time to review these. I entertain a motion for approval. So moved. Question by Ronald Second. Johnson, seconded by Vice Chair Johnson. Any questions about the minutes? No questions. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Discussion and adjustment to the agenda, starting with Todd Sutton. No, sir. Ms. Grant? No, sir. Uh, Vice Chair Johnson? No, sir. Mr. Hall? Yes, sir. We, we need to um, consider a motion uh, to grant the town of Clayton um, easement at uh, Powhatan School. So we need to put that on the agenda. Um, the easement to Powhatan School, we can put it in Section 10. C seven in administrative reports and recommendations is that yes sir thank you um, Dr Smith none sir Ronald Johnson no adjustments okay. Mr Chairman uh, recommend a motion to approve the adjustment of the agenda for ten C seven motion by Todd Sutton second second by Ronald Johnson. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries 7 0. Now, the best part of the meeting, Miss Crystal Rock. Good afternoon, Mr. Wooten, Lady Vice Chair Johnson. Dr. Renfro and members of the board. This is the best part, and we appreciate your having us kick this off, um, our four o'clock meeting, with our character ed recognitions. Thank you so very much. What we know about this particular portion of our program or our agenda is that our parents give to them the best, give to us the best of themselves. And so we are so happy to recognize the students that we have with us today. And those students come to us from Innovation Academy at South Campus, Smithfield Selma High School, Swift Creek Middle School, and South Johnston High School. We'll start with the student from Innovation Academy, where the principal is Kelly Johnson. The student is Daisy Perales Olalde. And if uh, Daisy will come and join me, and we also have, um, we'll be translating for her family again this month, oh, which yeah. is wonderful because, as you know, we have a very successful dual language program mm -hmm. in our district. So this is just a demonstration <coughs> of that. So Daisy, <coughs> on their way in. Hmm. Invite the parents to come take pictures too. Yes, absolutely. If they want to take pictures. If the parents uh, of these students, anybody wants to take pictures, this is your boardroom, so you can come behind the board members or anywhere in the room that you would like to take a picture. So don't, feel free to come behind the board and uh, take whatever pictures you'd like to take. Right. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce you to Daisy Perales Olalde. Her parents are Juana Olalde and Manuel Perales. Daisy sets an excellent example of someone who shows <laughs> compassion. She is often seen extending a helping hand to her classmates as well as her teachers. Once absent from school due to an illness, she communicated with her discovery group to collaborate via FaceTime on their project-based learning project in preparation for the upcoming exposition. 
part of the pioneer choir, she quietly encourages her fellow singers to keep mm. trying when they find the process of learning to blend their voices challenging. Her steadfast leadership in planning our school's dedication ceremony in a way that allowed her parents, uh, I'm sorry, her peers to feel included and valued was inspiring. She makes sure her friends feel celebrated on their birthdays. Daisy is patient and kind to everyone she interacts with. Daisy encompasses compassion every day and shares it with everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, Daisy Perales Olave. Gracious, good job. And we'll translate for her parents now. Buenas tardes. Eh, este, Daisy demuestra un ejemplo excelente como alguien que demuestra compasión. Ella muchas veces se le ha visto extendiendo una mano de ayuda para sus compañeros de clases como también para sus maestros. Una vez ausente de la escuela, de la escuela debido a una enfermedad, ella se comunicó con su grupo de descubrimiento para colaborar vía el FaceTime para poder trabajar con ellos en el proyecto basado en lo que estaban aprendiendo en preparación para una exposición que se presentaba eh, eh, próximamente. Eh, parte de lo que es el coro de pioneros, ella calladamente motiva a sus compañeros que también cantan en el coro a seguir tratando lo que ellos puedan para procesar en lo que es el aprendizaje con las voces mezcla, eh, eh, mezcladas. Este, ella, su liderazgo en planificar eh, a la dedicación de la escuela, la ceremonia, eh, la ha ayudado a que ella pueda incluir a sus compañeros, sentirse incluidos y valorados, es una inspiración. Ella hace sentir a sus amigos eh, para colaborar para sus cumpleaños. Daisy es paciente, eh, muy buena con todos, eh, interacciona con todos con todos los compañeros de clases. Ella también tiene compasión todos los días y lo comparte con todos. Gracias. and parents that our character ed recognized students will be their pictures will be taken at the end of the presentation together as a group <coughs> our next student comes to us from <coughs> smithfield selma high school where the principal is david allen and our student is maria garcia ortega How are you? Good. Good. ladies and gentlemen since Maria's first days at Smithville Selma High School, she has put others before herself, often offering her time and empathy to students coming into new groups and programs. Maria has served as a counselor for the Asheboro Student Leadership Retreat, and during that time has shared her desire <coughs> to help others and treat them with dignity, respect, and <coughs> compassion. In this, she has helped aspiring young leaders at school navigate the waters of school service. Her compassion for others has been beneficial to the Triple S Food Pantry, FCA, and the swim team. In each of these endeavors, she has shown a great empathy for students who need encouragement and a place to belong. Her smile is contagious and her love for people <coughs> abounds. When one of her classmates moved away last year, she organized a surprise <coughs> going away celebration for her on her last day of school. As an international baccalaureate di diploma program student, she has centered her CAS project around mentoring ELL students who are making the transition between eighth and ninth grades. She strives to help others feel at home wherever they are. Triple S recognizes Cheyenne this month for helping to make, I'm sorry, this is uh, Maria. I changed her name, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> that smile, you know. <laughs> 
much we recognize Maria this month for helping to make Johnston County a better place. Ladies and gentlemen, Maria Garcia Ortega. Congratulations, thank you for being a leader. And if Maria has family or friends here, you're welcome to step forward and take mm -hmm. pictures. Okay, will you take pictures? No? Okay. Thank you for your heart. Thank you for being a leader. <laughs> Maria, please accept this as a small token of our appreciation. Best wishes and keep up the good work. We're so proud Thank of you. you. Amen. Our next student comes to us from Swift Creek Middle School, where the principal is Carrie Evans. Uh, eighth grade student, Urian Van, or Yuri as we call her. Her parents are Barbara and Jimmy Van. One word to describe Yuri Van is amazing. She is the most trustworthy student and always dependable. Yuri goes above and beyond to help her classmates and teachers without being asked and with a smile on her face. When other students need help, she is the first person to volunteer. She is selfless and consistently puts the needs of others before her own. In group activities, Yuri takes a leadership role and encourages others to be the best that they can be in a way that is positive and uplifting. She is also actively involved in church and school activities, including the Beta Club in which she helps participate in food drives, as well as volunteers her time to help others. Yuri gains the respect of her classmates, teachers, and friends through her eagerness to help and her willingness to lend a helping hand and make a difference <clears throat> every day. All of her teachers and anyone that comes in contact with her would agree that she is a kind and compassionate individual who is worthy of this award and will surely make a lasting contribution to the school and community. Ladies and gentlemen, Urian Van. Congratulations. Thank you for being such a good example. That's your baby. Yuri, please accept this as a small token of our appreciation for what you bring <coughs> to the Johnston County Public Schools community. We're very proud of you. Amen. Our final character ed uh, student recognition comes to us from South Johnston High School, where the principal is David Pierce. This is 12th grade student Michaela Cheyenne Gregory. Cheyenne Gregory is the model student of compassion, which means to have sympathy and concern for others. Cheyenne is truly one of a kind. She is firm in her beliefs and is a courageous leader. Cheyenne is a quiet, intuitive person that always wants the best for her and others. She helps others in need and is always there to contribute a new idea. Cheyenne often helps other students when they are struggling with art concepts. She uses her compassion to help others by being patient and understanding. Cheyenne has a helper's heart, always ready to help, always willing to serve. She will take the time to explain the concepts and deeper meaning of texts <clears throat> and create a bigger picture of understanding for the students around her. Her compassion is shown through her commitment 
to volunteering her time with the Art Honor Society at South Johnston High School, where she is vice president. Cheyenne is present at every volunteer event and the first one to lend a helping hand. Cheyenne has also been contributing her time to make South Johnston High School a more beautiful place by painting several murals throughout the building. Uh -huh. Cheyenne also donates her class time to guide other students, helping them with art techniques or ideas if needed. She also collaborates with other students to help project, to help project ideas and reach their potential. She isn't obvious in her ways, but she has a strong heart and wants others to feel valued and heard. Cheyenne's authentic and charitable character is evident to all who meet and work with her. South Johnston High School is proud of Cheyenne and the compassion that she brings to our school. Ladies and gentlemen, Michaela Cheyenne Gregory. Congratulations, thank you for being such a good example. Cheyenne, <laughs> <laughs> please accept this as a memento of our appreciation for exhibiting great character. We, we are so proud of you. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Him over to Brian Vetrano, who will bring you our employees of the month. Thank you, Crystal, Mr. Chairman, Madam Vice Chair, Board Members, Dr. Renfro. It's always my honor to present to you employees of the month. Our employees of the month for December, if I can have Miss Denise. Denise Blanchard, join me. <laughs> I'll do all the talking. All you have to do is stand next to me. <laughs> Ms. Blanchard serves as the Student Information Data Manager at West Clayton Elementary. She was nominated by Charlene Covington, Student Information Instructional Coordinator for the district. Ms. Covington shared that Ms. Blanchard's actual work site may be West Clayton Elementary School, but in all actuality, she is a valuable asset beyond those walls. Denise is quick to volunteer to help new data managers, veteran data managers, as well as the Power School office. Denise has gone above and beyond the call of duty for teachers at her school, as well as for all of the other elementary teachers who are using the standards-based report card. While attending the Power <coughs> Teacher Rep training, she saw a need for video resources for teachers. In collaboration with a fellow West Clayton Elementary employee, Denise created screencasts for the end of quarter process and shared them with all elementary teachers. The power teacher is out of her area of expertise. She saw a need, researched, and filled the need with a solution. She is an asset to her school and our school system. Ms. Blanchard, we congratulate you for being our Classified Employee of the Month. Thank you. What you do, all you do. Thank you. Appreciate your dedication. Thank you. Thank you so much. And just when you thought you were finished, a few more <laughs> items, keychains, certificate, and a gift card. Thank you. Thank so you. Our certified employee of the month for December, Mr. Mike Thompson. If Mr. Thompson will please come forward. Good to see you. Good guy. Mr. Thompson is a behavioral specialist for our school system. 
He was nominated as Employee of the Month by Kelly Wood, one of our autism specialists. Ms. Wood shared that Mr. Thompson is a great asset to Johnston County Public Schools. He is a quiet and patient person, which serves him well in this position. He continually builds relationships with students, teachers, administrators, and parents. He assists schools with techniques, ideas, and strategies to help meet students' needs. He is extremely knowledgeable with behavioral interventions and how to use them efficiently and effectively to maximize student potential and minimize student struggles socially, academically, and behaviorally. He is willing to share his expertise, time, and energy to help benefit schools and our school system as a whole. He wants no recognition, but he deserves it. Mr. Thompson, we appreciate what you do, and congratulations for being our Certified Employee of the Month. As well, a small token of our appreciation, certificate, gift card, and a keychain for you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Since we have no public comment, I'll give everybody a minute to file out and take pictures, and those who want to leave can leave, but we are welcome to stay <clears throat> until we get through. But um, Ms. Roberts, are they supposed to take pictures in the hallway? Okay. Okay. All right, great. Uh, there are no public comments, but we do have comments from the board and chair, and we'll start that with Ronald Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> grateful to be here, grateful to be elected. I certainly would like to start by pointing out some very familiar faces. I feel like I'm having a little reunion here. Carson, Megan, Coach Vincent, and Mr. Daughtry as he walks out. It's good to see Triple S represented in many capacities and so strongly here. And if I miss somebody, I'm sorry, but those are the faces that are sticking out. We started out by bringing J.C. Good in November, and it was just a wonderful event. If you had the opportunity to make it, that is great. I'd like to thank Ms. Roberts and Dr. Renfro for helping us pull that off. J.C. Good was injured by a young man who was texting and driving. She is permanently disabled, and her parents were killed, and she goes all over the country talking about the hazards of texting and driving, and, you know, we lost the last time we compiled the data, 2,136 teenagers in traffic related deaths and that's certainly too many so her message and her word was very well received by the students at Cleveland High School and uh, Corinth Holders High School very good place very good event um, had the opportunity to attend numerous Christmas functions throughout the county everybody's doing a wonderful job <coughs> promoting one of the most important holidays of the year the most important holidays of the year and we all need to remember while we celebrate this the true meaning and to care about one another and do for one another as you would for yourself um west smithfield elementary i see miss bryant wonderful thanksgiving program that your first grade team pulled off that i had the opportunity to attend and the flag flag dedication i attended with todd special thanks to miss paula woodall i don't see her here but she did a tremendous amount to make that happen um <coughs> and lastly i've got a lot of emails phone calls from the teachers and i just want to say Thank you for your sacrifice. If you're here today and you teach for Johnston County Schools or you work for Johnston County Schools, you are the reason that we are a great school system. We've got a great leader here, Dr. Renfro, but whether you're the superintendent, chief of police, general, CEO, you're no better than your weakest link or your bottom troop. And you guys are on the ground. You are doing the footwork. You are doing the real work for Johnston County Schools. So I want to say thank you for that. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Uh, Dr. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Um, first of all, acknowledgement to Mr. Toll Avery and his staff at Forex Middle School. It was a tremendous, just a tremendous example of JOCO 2020 project-based learning, empowered students and teachers. It was excellent. Um, normally, I share what I've done over the previous month, but since we're in December and at the end of the year, I'm going to change that up today and just use my time to express appreciation and support of Dr. Renfro and his cabinet, now four, not eight, um, for their leadership for making so many positive changes for students. There's the Fire Academy, the Innovation Academy, the Three Choices Academies, and the move of many central office staff to the schools just beginning our innovative re, um, um, updates. Dr. Renfro listens to parents, teachers, principals, and students. He goes into the schools for leadership meetings instead of at the central office, and he's <clears throat> active at the central level, at the state level, I'm sorry, which has kept Johnston County Schools on the cutting edge. And special thanks to all the teachers and principals who last year were scratching their heads saying, where are we going as a system? Now those teachers and principals are empowered to, re and we saw that today. It was such a powerful example of when you let people do their jobs, they do their jobs. It was amazing. And thanks to your leadership and the leadership of the cabinet. Students are the beneficiaries of unleashing all of this innovation and personalized learning. So thank you to all of those in leadership, the teachers, the staff, and the parents <coughs> for giving Johnston County Public Schools the gift of learning. Thank you, Mr. Ren Dr. Renfro, and your staff, including teachers, students, and staff. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Brother Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have a couple of things. One, I would just like to reiterate what uh, Dr. Smith has said about our superintendent, his staff, uh, I've known the young man for a long time, and uh, his heart for teachers and students has is, is just always been one of the amazing qualities that, that he has portrayed, and our school system is moving in directions that will keep us among the leaders, if not in the state, uh, certainly throughout the nation. Thank you, Dr. Renfro. <clears throat> I have a Cock Spaniel puppy. She's... <laughs> This is her second Christmas, and um, she really loves Hallmark. <laughs> we have to watch Hallmark. <laughs> Seriously. Um, she doesn't, but anyway. This is a Hallmark moment kind of thing. Uh, recently, I heard about a situation in, in our, one of our schools, and uh, sometimes the good news just doesn't get out. The good news just for some reason is, is not shared as readily as negative stuff or the things that sometimes the media wants to paint as negative. Uh, there's no, no way to paint this but as very, very positive. And it's an example of what kinds of good things happen in Johnson County schools and the hearts that our people have. Uh, in August, uh, a man <clears throat> visited one of our elementary schools, and he, he had three children, a six-year-old, uh, a three-year-old, and an infant. <clears throat> he had moved to our county um, because of domestic situations, and um, he was seeking to enroll his little girl <clears throat> in, uh, in school. And he was uh, really dealing with the hardships of, of a father and a mother and all the things that he was now responsible for. And uh, <clears throat> he was doing his best to keep his children together and, and all that goes into that. Um, <clears throat> but in, in November, he came, he came to the school and he was just exasperated, uh, he, he had tried so hard, he just couldn't get everything done for his children that, that needed to get done. And he felt like that he was not being the provider he needed to be and his children were suffering. And he asked the <clears throat> principal um, if there was some way that the school could help him take care of his children. He couldn't do it anymore. and. Um, 
school gets busy and they contact their social worker and um, she gets busy and they start dealing with issues and trying to figure out some way to help provide for for these children and and uh, <clears throat> eventually as it worked out now uh, these three children are in the homes of uh, of people that have been approved by um, the social worker and all that's involved in all the, those kinds of things. Um, uh, one of one of the kids, one of the children, is 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 in the home of a, a board member of this school's uh, PTA. Um, another teacher assistant at the school uh, has a one of the children in her home. And uh, a, a teacher at a preschool has the third one. And uh, to me, this is just a miraculous story. These children are in places now where they're loved and, and where they're uh, <clears throat> being provided for and, and their needs are being met. And, and this happened because uh, people in our school system, <coughs> not at just this particular place, but certainly including this particular place, um, went far, far beyond the call of responsibility or duty or whatever, and, and they have provided for the, for the safety and for the welfare of these uh, three, three children. And two of the children have, are now, have, have attended church for the very first time in their lives. And, um, they, these these people at this school saw the need and saw the the uh, sincere um, I guess desperation of of this father and and they have provided for these children. I don't, I, that's just a great story, sir. And these are the kinds of people that are in the offices and in the classrooms of our schools, and I think it's great. That's wonderful. Thank you. Okay, so. Vice Chair Johnson. Yes, sir. Time is short. <laughs> um, thank you, Mr. Hall. That was very touching. Thank you. I really appreciate it. And Dr. Smith and uh, Mr. Johnson. <laughs> uh, mine is short, like I said. I just want to just congratulate our principals that are here today, especially those that have served as hosts for us for the, from the Board of Education when we come to your school. I'm just thinking about you uh, from uh, South Smithfield and some of the other schools we have visited. I just commend you guys for what you do each day and preparing for Amen. us. That's an awesome job, and you really go all out to really help and share and sort of showcase what you're doing in the schools and how the young people are, are learning. And you can see, actually see learning take place. Uh, we did go to Four Oaks, Oak, Four Oaks uh, Middle School today. And of course, we, this is my second time going to a, we, the board has met there. I've been to many things before. But I just want to point some things out that, that um, these young people uh, displayed. It was, it was just, just beautiful, just outstanding job that they had done. That's right, you're the principal there. No, you're not. <laughs> I thought he was in there. We go to your school my, next time. Um, but but it, what those young people are learning and how they display it and how they share it, and um, it's not a cut and dry like we used to get in school. I'll put it like this when I, got, when I got when I was in school. They spit it out to you, and you have to give it back to them just like it was given to you. That's not like that anymore. You actually see learning take place in the schools. And uh, the young people, of course, they start from the beginning. From the time you get there, the grounds and everything is perfect, so you can see that they have done a lot of good things in getting prepared for the board, and they're putting their best foot forward. And so they display these kind of things and um, involve the students. And we saw some things, um, sorry. We saw some things to, uh, today at Forks Middle that we see every time we go to the schools, I think. It's, uh, you try to uh, judge as to which is the best, who's doing the best, who's, who, who's reaching the, the children like they should. It's not like that anymore. Everybody's reaching. 
I, and all the teachers and the, I mean, from the custodian, the teachers, everybody, office assistants, assistant principals, everyone is working. And, you, and the young people are just working together in groups or individually. But what most important, I think, that, that, that uh, impressed me was how they had everything organized to a T, to a T. And every child knew what they were doing. And you could see it. And they, and they carried us on the tour as we had lunch. And they uh, shared with us their knowledge. So every child knew what was going on in the school as well. So, um, that's, that's a beautiful thing. And you're talking about innovation. I thought that was truly an innovation yes, uh, there. We have an innovation academy, but all the teachers, everybody seemed to be on target. And I just want to commend you all for all the hard work you do. And uh, you probably think that, well, maybe they don't appreciate it. Yes, we do. We appreciate everything that you do. And of course, I can't go without letting those at the central office, especially my superintendent, because I think, I think he's done an outstanding job in, in guiding you, directing you, and helping you to make some decisions along with his uh, staff that, uh, 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 that's working here in the, in the central office building. So it's, it's everybody know what they're doing. I can tell you that. They know. And uh, the young people have certainly picked up on it, and they can, they can reiterate what are the things they're doing. So congratulations for what you're doing, and just keep the good work. We know learning is taking place. Yeah. We know that because we've seen it. So thank you so much, and you all have a great holiday season. Thank you, Vice Chair Johnson. Teresa Grant. Um, also uh, wanted to say at the Four Oaks Mill today, there were some amazing young leaders uh, that were escorting us around. Yeah. And uh, uh, I, I can't wait to see where they are in a few <laughs> years. They were, they were on top of it. and. Uh, uh, one of the things they talked about was a critical thinking skills class. Uh, I have some folks I work with that I'd like to send over to that <laughs> class. Uh, <laughs> see, these young leaders, I definitely uh, know these adult leaders could use it. Um, went to the uh, early college uh, science night, saw some great uh, presentations there. I'd have to say that the uh, uh, young man that did the uh, presentation on caffeine, that one was uh, quite an amazing uh, one, and he says we can have two cups of coffee a day and we're good to go. Uh, if we don't go over that, we're doing really well, so I'm going to take him up on that and stick to my two cups a day. Uh, the uh, principal's <coughs> lunch uh, that uh, we had was uh, amazing. I know that, uh, I know Crystal had help, uh, but uh, I think she was key in getting that set up, and I heard a lot of great positive things, but Boy, that was some good food uh, that uh, the restaurants brought in, and I think everybody had a had a great time. Uh, attended uh, Triple S had a uh, performing arts program last night, uh, and uh, went there to listen to that program. They had uh, singing and dancing going on. A uh, uh, nice thing. Uh, Dr. Renfro, uh, you preach relationships, 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 and. Uh, I think you and your staff have done a great job uh, at uh, doing that. We can see evidence of that in the schools from the principals to the staff to the teachers to the students. Uh, relationships were evident in the schools we walked around in today and any of the others that we visited. I also know that any problem that I've come to you with, big or small, from uh, any parent or teacher that's reached out to me, it's been resolved satisfactorily. And, and I appreciate uh, your willingness uh, to do that. You also <coughs> preach empowerment. And uh, I've seen some pretty empowered principals and teachers uh, when we go out and visit these schools uh, and some very enthusiastic uh, principals and teachers. And I know we're going to have some uh, great presentations today from West Smithville Elementary and South Smithville Elementary. and. Uh, I was able to attend one of the stakeholders meeting, not the other, but I know those are going to be awesome presentations, and I know we are heading in the right uh, direction with uh, those schools, and all that came about through relationships and empowerment. So thank you for uh, the insight and the foresight that you had in uh, JOCO 2020 and working with your staff and, uh, and all these, uh, every member of the school to help uh, promote that, and I'm Proud to be a part of this board, proud to be a part
part of Johnston County Public Schools and uh, thankful to be in a school system that uh, uh, is willing to um, uh, do all that it can for every student and also willing to uh, think about this Christmas season and um, wish everyone a Merry Christmas and uh, uh, I'm glad to be here. Thank you, Ms. Grant. Mr. Sutt. Well, I just I'd like echo everything that the rest of the board members said about Forks Middle School today. What a phenomenal lunch, what phenomenal students they have. Uh, just like every other school we have visited, um, we got some great leaders, up and coming leaders in Johnson County Public Schools. And that just um, goes to show what type of uh, teachers and uh, staff we have in each and every school in Johnson County. Um, you know, it, it, it's just, you know, we, we deal with growth, but at the same time, uh, we're growing because of good people that we have in each and every one of our schools. So I want to thank each staff member, whether a custodian, TA, work in the office, um, teachers, obviously, principals. Uh, it goes all the way to central staff and to Dr. Renfro's office. Without each and every one of you on a daily basis, Johnston County Public Schools would not be what it is and um, continuing to grow, we would have other problems that uh, we don't want to even think about. So thank you again. It's, uh, I mean, it's not a, it's a broken record, it's thank you. Um, many different things over the past month that I've attended, was able to go to both of the stakeholders meetings at South Smithfield and West Smithfield. And to say that I'm excited is an understatement of what the presentations were at each and one of those schools. So I commend everybody from each school that had a part in putting that presentation together. It was phenomenal um, and uh, look forward to it today. And, and, and I'm just going to close on um, just my prayer this, this season is that everyone involved in Johnson County Public Schools and anybody in Johnson County and across this great state has a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And we thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Sutton. I will try to keep it short. Um, I appreciate the leadership of the school system, and that's through Dr. Renfro and the senior staff, and it goes right on down <coughs> uh, to teachers and custodians. But uh, Dr. Renfro, I appreciate all the challenges that are thrown at public school system all across the state. Uh, you're full steam ahead, and you got a vision. You show compassion, but mainly is your leadership to this district is. Uh, unshakable and uh, this Joko 2020 is is infectious and it's going to spread like wildfire not just in Johnston County but in the state of North Carolina and you know I appreciate your vision and, and leadership and and your plowing forward uh, we could all we could listen to a lot of negatives but uh, you're always about making everybody better each and every day and I appreciate your steadfastness and, and getting this done um, I know December is a tough year for you, tough time of the year for you. And I wanted you to know that this board loves you and we support you in everything that you do, your entire family. Because it takes a village. You, I mean, you're gone all the time, and, and I, I pray for your family each and every day that their dad would be safe. And I uh, appreciate your leadership. You know, a lot of people, I might get emotional here, but a lot of people. <clears throat> especially my dad, questions uh, why I want to be a part of the school system. You know, he was a 35-year educator, a uh, long administrator at Smithfield Selma. And uh, every time I go see him, he's in an Alzheimer's unit in Goldsboro. And every time I go see him, well, I'll say something about the school board. He said, have you lost your mind? <laughs> <laughs> he's not lost his mind enough to know that he thinks I've lost mine. But... Um, uh, the reason I do it, and, and the reason I'm bringing this up today is, is there's a teacher sitting in this room that brings back a lot of memories. And uh, my background, I came from a broken family. And uh, my mom and dad, of course they loved their kids, but you know, just couldn't get along with one another. And uh, Johnson County Schools prepared me for life. 
uh, even in that situation. And all you teachers, educators that are sitting in this room, you make a difference. It's true. Whether you think it or not, you're making a difference. Uh, Coach Vinson, when I needed a hug, he was there. When I, want, when I was at somewhere I wasn't supposed to be, he was there. When I didn't want to show my dad my grades, although he could go to every room and get them, uh, Coach Vincent was there. And when I needed to talk, Coach Vincent, you were there. And uh, the reason I give to this school is because it prepared me for life. And the relationships that you're building as educators change people's lives. And, uh, you know, there. There's not a year that goes by that my wife, she's a 30-year educator too, she'll get a card in the mail from a parent that she taught 20 years ago uh, talking about a certain day that she that Paula changed their this student's life, which reflects on their family and generations to come. So that's why I serve Johnson County Schools because it gave me an opportunity to be successful. And uh, Coach V, I want to personally thank you for being a part of my life and being that void that you filled to change my life so I could change other people's lives. And uh, that's, uh, that's why I'm blessed to live in Johnston County and, I, and, and give my time to Johnston County Public Schools because there's 36,000 opportunities for us to change the lives so they can do it for generations to come. And uh, God bless y'all for being educators. Amen. Thank you. Now you know why we just elected him <laughs> again as the chairman of the Johnston County Public Schools. Because he has passion for children. He's been through, through the ranks. He knows, he loves every, all of you, he loves all the children in this county. And that's how he feels. This is, this is every day, this, this man, every day. So what he's saying is actually, this is you're getting the real thing. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Next on the agenda <clears throat> is advisory board members starting with uh, oh, appointment sorry. advisory board members starting with Vice Chair Johnson. Oh yes, I talk so much. Okay, Carl Ruth Holder um, High School uh, principal, Mr. Uh, Daniels. We have a new member appointed for a three-year term. Term uh, Sandy Jones. Her term ends in uh, 2020. Thank you, Ms. Josh. We'll let that serve as a motion. And next on the agenda is Teresa Grant. East Clayton Elementary Principal Jamie Tyler recommends new member appointment of three years for Denise Bridges, term to end June 2020. Cleveland Elementary Principal Maureen Hanahue uh, recommends new member appointment of three years for Nair Hernandez, term to end in June 2020. Thank you, Ms. Grant. That'll be our second. Todd Sutton. Uh, Powhatan Elementary Principal Dan Kerwin recommends reappointment of members Jennifer Jones, Stuart Lee, Lloyd Pugh, Pugh, and Nayla Austin for three years each, <coughs> terms to end in June 2020. Thank you, Mr. Sutton. Uh, Ronald Johnson. Yes, sir. Ms. Bryant has put together an all star team here. Um, <laughs> new member appointments of three years each for Jenna Lewis, Melissa Center, Alyssa Bizzle, Ann Cobley, and Kimberly Bird terms to end in June of 2020. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. We've got a, a motion by Dorothy Johnson, second by Teresa Grant for advisory appointments. All those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Dr. Renfro. Mr. Chairman, at this time I would ask that the board approve consent items 10A1A through 10A1J. Uh, board, you've had time to, to review these, uh, entertain a motion. So so second. Ronald Johnson, second by Todd Sutton. Any questions? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries 7 0. Dr. Price. <laughs> Good afternoon, Vice Chair, Board of Ed members, Dr. Jim Lawrence. Today I have but one item, exhibit number 10B1, the South Elementary and West Smithville Elementary Innovation Proposals. This item 
as an action item. During the 2016-17 school year, the Board of Education voted to uh, discontinue the enhanced calendar. This determination was based on marginal data presented for two consecutive years. The Board of Education directed the system to support the two schools in identifying potential innovative replacements for the calendars. The following presentation provides an overview of that decision-making process and the vision chosen <coughs> by each school. Laura Makey, principal at South Smithfield, uh, Smithfield Elementary, and Sharon Bryant, principal at uh, West Smithfield Elementary, will be presenting the school's proposals. Thank you. <laughs> so the rookie is first. <laughs> <laughs> you, you'll do just fine. <laughs> Good evening. Um, I want to just first say thanks to each of you for your dedication. I've seen all of you at our schools this year at some point, and I just want to say on behalf of not just West Smithville Elementary, but as the leaders of leaders in Johnston County Public Schools, the principals, the assistant principals, we do appreciate all that you do on the front end and the back end of Johnston County Public Schools. Um, I'm not going to be before you long today. I just want to take about four minutes of your time and talk to you about our vision at West Smithfield Elementary School. Change is an opportunity to do something amazing. And prior to me taking, to, taking the seat at West Smithfield Elementary, I actually had the opportunity to meet with several stakeholders. Dr. Renfro in the cabinet took the time to sit with us in here and just give us some really good information about the schools that we were going into. Had an opportunity to bring in my staff and give them the opportunity to sit down one-on-one. -on -one. Had a stakeholders meeting and just started meeting people within the community. And there was three questions going into elementary, being that my background was middle school and high school, and going into an elementary school, there was just three questions that I really had for my staff. And those three questions were, what are some things that's going well? What are some things or areas of growth for our school? And what do you need from me as an administrator? And out of those conversations, we clearly knew that at West Smithfield Elementary School, there was a need for change. There were some great things going on, but because of just some different dynamics, some of the school culture, we just needed to start reshaping it and just reforming it. We had a culture, but we needed to relook at that and get a, a facelift or a transformation, if that's what you want to call it. And so we began to brainstorm with our population, I'm sorry, with our population and our demographics, we were 55% were Hispanic, 27% black, 13% white, and 5% other. We needed to find something that worked for us. Because if it doesn't fit for you, it may fit for everyone else, but it has to fit for your school and your demographics and your people. And we decided, um, let's look at dual. So we took a trip out to Selma Elementary, which has a grand dual language program there. And that conversation came about with our staff. And then we had an opportunity. I'm, my background is with an AVID school. And I've been in AVID for about 13 years. And we started having conversations without even knowing we were going to have an initiative or the possibility of restart. So we started talking about AVID. Well, AVID is not something elementary schools typically have. In fact, it was very hard for Dr. Garland and Dr. Price and them to find an <coughs> AVID school for us to visit. So we started talking about what is it that we need here at West Smithfield Elementary School as we go on our journey. And we, we took the site visits, and clearly when we went to Selma Elementary, we did not and have not discounted dual language. But because that program, it is just for one grade level, we really need something that was going to affect our whole school. And with that, we took a site vi visit to Killian Elementary in Columbia, South Carolina. And when I say to you, that was confirmation. What we saw those students able to do, not what the teachers were able to do, but what the students, students that looked like our students. It was a mirror of our demographics of students. <coughs> and what we saw they were able to do on their own how they took ownership of their learning, how they were self-confident they spoke to us and looked us in our eyes and, and had conversations in the language they used. We clearly knew that AVID was definitely the direction that we needed to go. And when we looked at AVID, 
just so in case you've, you've never experienced it, AVID is, provides equal access to all students. It gives us an organizational system. It instills success, inspires belief in academic rigor and success. But for us, as we really began to look at it, both Triple S High School and Smithfield Middle School both have a strong AVID program. Um, and, I, and I said that word program, and I'm going to take it back, because AVID is not a program. It is just your way of doing things. It is the culture of what your school began to look like. And that is exactly what we needed. And so once we left there and we came back, our team came back, we were in conversations, we're clearly going to be an AVID elementary school. Now, that is an opportunity. Um, there are lots of opportunities, but that's an opportunity because an AVID elementary school is very rare. Um, that is one reason we had to go to the uh, Columbia, South Carolina. In North Carolina, there's only probably maybe I think we found three. And in those three, they've not implemented K-5. It's only been implemented maybe 3-5. We're looking at implementation from kindergarten through fifth grade. Uh, we just believe that we need to start them out the way we want them to go. And why wait until third grade right. to get them on board? So we're going to start kindergarten through fifth grade. And our goal is... Johnson County Schools can be the first school, not just in the state of North Carolina, but in just the history that has an avid feeder pattern from kindergarten through 12th grade. And so we are very much looking forward to becoming an avid school. What does this look like as far as um, next steps for us? Our next steps, we are very fortunate. I don't know if you're very familiar, but avid is extremely expensive extremely expensive but I am going to say that we are networking right now that our entire staff is going to receive professional development right at West Smithville Elementary School at the end of this school year or by the beginning or during the summer sometime during the summer so that we believe that we just cannot send a few people to be trained and bring them back and train our entire staff the way we need training in order to implement this the right way. We're also looking at, we've not, we've not um, completely said that we're not going to look at dual because there are, there are various paths we can go with dual. Being that dual is one grade level, we can look at some immersion possibility of making, um, having possibly next year a um, Spanish elective and how we can start looking at using next year for a planning year for dual language if we're not immersed into it in, from an elective after the 2017, no, 2018, 2019 school year. And with that, we have to recognize that um, we are 55% Hispanic. I have to say, I don't speak Spanish. Uh, we have three adults in our building who speak the language. We are partnering with Dr. Vetrano's office, and we are going to be on the search for dual uh, certified as well as classified personnel to help us. Now, we're not saying we're getting rid of our people, okay? That's not what I want us to take away, and that's not what I want my people to hear. What I want us to hear is that we're looking at having an opportunity so that we can engage not only in our, with our children, but also with our parents in our community. And so that is our initiative. We are looking forward to it. We know that it's going to bring some opportunities, but we're ready for those opportunities. Um, I can say hands down, um, Dr. Renfro, Dr. Price, Academic Innovations Office, they're on it. Uh, they keep me on it. So they are very knowledgeable. They are using networking, and they're keeping us in the know of what our next steps are. So as we transition into the year of 2018, 2019, and of course, West Smithfield Elementary is um, looking to be under the restart program, we're not looking to just do something else. We're looking to be innovative, but we're looking at that innovation in a way that it's not just going to be for a year or two. It's not a program. It is just who we are so that we can make sure that when our students graduate high school, they are prepared, whether it's for a four-year university, whether it's for a technical um, trade, or whether it's just to go work directly into the workforce. And so I thank you for your time this afternoon, and that is our goal, uh, West Smithville Elementary. We are looking at being a full K2, K5 Abbott School next year. Thank you. Don't, don't run, don't run too quick. Wow. Any questions for Ms. Bryant before she leaves the podium? I have a comment. You know, I don't hand out compliments too freely, but 
I would not have anyone else leading West Smithfield Elementary School but you, and I appreciate everything you do. I appreciate your knowledge, your charisma, your energy, and everything you're doing for the teachers and students <clears throat> out there. And I'm not the only one that feels that way. Earlier, there was a couple folks in the, on your board talking about the fantastic job you're doing, and I'm just proud to watch you do it. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank just you so we're much. We're just what excited you to watch it. Yeah, I'm it, glad that you, you recognize it and that you're doing something about it. Thank you. And I have to say, um, we have a great, I have a great staff at West Smithville Elementary School, and this transition could not have been as smooth as it has gone without the support of my teachers, my classified custodian, cafeteria workers, bus drivers. We have really worked as a unit. And that is what it's going to continue to take. So again, I thank each of you this afternoon. Mm -hmm. thank, you. thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Wooten, Vice Chair Johnson, Dr. Renfro, and fellow board members. Thank you very much for your time. Um, as you see on the slide, it says South Smithville Elementary vision for the future. Mm -hmm. But I have to stop really quick and say that it's not my vision. It is our vision. And I'm trying not to get emotional. <laughs> I, would like, I would like to thank the support that I have here. If you're a member of our school improvement team at South Smithville Elementary School, could you please stand? If you are a member of our Parent Advisory Council at South Smith Elementary School, could you please stand? Oh, wow. So I preface that because you guys blessed us with the chance to go on a journey to determine something very unique for our school. <clears throat> and again, it has been our journey. So let me just kind of take you through our journey for a moment. First of all, we all started trying to decide what we were going to do, and we knew that we needed to have a vision. That was the most important thing. What was going to be our goal? What was the goal for our students? And again, we wanted to tie it into the correlation with JOCO 2020. So we knew that we wanted to have confident, competent students and really focus on relationships, relevance, and innovation. So with that vision, we knew that we needed to have a mission. Mm -hmm. What were we going to do to get our students to that vision? So again, we worked really hard as a team to come up with a, vi a mission that was going to guide us to our vision. So again, we came up with a mission. We knew that we had to come up with criteria. That no matter which journey that we chose, we knew that there were certain things that we needed to stand by. We knew that we needed something that was research-based and inquiry-based. We knew that we needed to have something that was going to provide this professional development, the resources. We knew that it needed to be assessed. We knew that it needed to be evaluated. And we knew that we needed to um, make sure that we had assessments that could project and make sure that we were maintaining what we were doing. So again, we set up our vision, our mission, and then we established our criteria that was going to guide us on this journey. So we were lucky enough to go on three different journeys. The first journey is we visited STEM schools. We went to DC and worked with the Smithsonian Institute with Dr. Sam Houston, and we learned all about STEM. We learned about what STEM was, and we saw what STEM looked like in the classroom blown away. It was awesome. Then we decided to check out dual language. So, so of course we went to Selma, which is of course recognized nationally in our state for their dual language program, and again, blown away. It was wonderful. Our third stop, though, was the IB schools. And we wanted to make sure that we found some IB schools that were Title I schools. So we searched, and with the help of the Innovation Office, we found two Title I schools in Charlotte Mecklenburg County, and we went to visit them. And when we were there, we were blown away as well. So wow, we came back with three different choices, and we didn't know what to do. <laughs> so one of the things that we also did is we surveyed all of our stakeholders, parents, teachers, and students. And from that, we determined what kind of qualities would we like to have our students at South Smithfield have when you have a graduate from South Smithfield. The words that are in red, as you can see, problem solvers, confident, responsible, works well with others, a desire to learn, and determined were overwhelmingly um, noticed among all stakeholders. So that gave us some input as well. 
So we took all of this information and we put it into this really cool thing called a Trago Ed Decision Analysis. And I believe that you guys have a copy of that as well mm -hmm. at your table. And then what this does is it takes all of the information that we were looking at based on that criteria that we knew we wanted. And we plugged it into this um, system and this made us look at things objectively. So we took the criteria, we based it on what our, our wants were, we weighted it, and we listed the alternatives, and lo and behold, what stood out in an objective format, because data does not lie, is that IB would be the choice for South Smithfield. So we recommend that based on the research <coughs> con um, conducted by this wonderful leadership team, that we recommend that South Smithfield Elementary School become an international baccalaureate program focused with the primary years program. Um, the reason why we chose this, of course, is that it correlates with where stakeholders said that they wanted. It correlates with that shared vision that we started with long before we even knew what we were going to do. It matches our mission and it supports our criteria. So it gives us everything that we really wanted right here in the IB program. Not to mention, IB is truly JOCO 2020. Mm -hmm. It focuses on relationships, mm -hmm. relevance, and innovation. So, what is IB? Basically, is a way of teaching students holistically. It involves the whole child, and it provides that sense of community partnership and giving them the confidence and the confidence that they need. What it does is it develops a <coughs> learner profile. There are 10 qualities and 10 traits that they follow, which is very similar to what we've already established at South Smithfield through our dynamic acronym. So again, we're using these learner profiles to develop the type of student that we want as we progress um, in their education. Teachers would instruct students through themes, which again makes learning relevant and helps them make connections. So again, this is one of the ways that they would create and teach the standard course of study, but through interdisciplinary themes. But this, what's really cool is that we are already doing a lot of these things already. We're already doing some of our community meetings, um, problem-based learning. We already offer Spanish as an enhancement, and we make those global connections. What IB is going to do for us is it's going to give us a common language, a common practice, and it's going to give us that professional development that we need to increase our efficacy at school. A timeline. So, here we are, I'm presenting to you guys today um, in December, and we hope that in January, as part of our short term goals, is that we're going to investigate the IB candidacy. Um, we realize that becoming an IB school is a three year phase, it's a three year process. And so we hope that over this summer, we um, will train 12 to 15 of our teachers with a cohort and then bring on other teachers in the next upcoming summers. Throughout that, IB will also offer us professional development and we will be working with the Academic Innovation Office to give us support as well. So, another really, really cool thing is what we're going to do at South Smithfield is helping us with this trajectory of what we're doing here as part of the Triple S Strong Movement of our schools. We know that if we give our students the foundation that they need at our elementary school, we can prepare them for any of the middle schools that they would feed into whether it be the Innovation Academy or Smithfield Middle School. Smithfield Middle School is looking and is considering to be part of the IB Middle Years Program, which would fall right in line with where we're going. Of course, you know that Triple S does offer the Diploma Program, which is just one aspect of IB. IB also encompasses a career program, and they would be offering the Middle <coughs> Years Program as well. But not only that, no matter which avenue our students would choose, the foundation that we give them in elementary school will get them ready if should they go into AVID or academies or college career promise. So, initial cost, it is a little pricey, but it's good stuff, is there's an application cost of $4,500. The yearly subscription would be $10,500. We request for an on-site IB coordinator to be at school to assist with this. And then, of course, the um, supplies and the professional development would be somewhere between fifty and 60000 each year. We are Triple S Strong. <coughs> we are JOCO 2020. We are South Smithfield. And we are dynamic.
questions? No. Oh. Just another wow. <laughs> Just another wow. Awesome. Thanks for all you do. You. And your staff. Mm -hmm. Thank you for They were worried about. I've never had a standing ovation. <laughs> <laughs> we believe that. Well, your mic down a little bit so we can. <laughs> <laughs> so you didn't give me my stool today. So, uh, you know, we believe that we make work what is ours, and um, right. what you just heard is a great grassroots effort of them creating what they need at their schools, and I believe that they will do a tremendous job. Um, kudos again to the entire uh, stakeholder groups at each one of these schools. Um, this is an action item, so turn it over for vote. Uh, board members, I'm excited to bring an action item to you on West Smithfield Elementary and South Smithfield Elementary innovative proposals. I entertain a motion. So moved. Moved. Second. Third. Motion by Butler Hall, <laughs> second by Dr. Smith. Any other questions? All those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Thank you very much. Chairman Moon, can I make one comment? Uh, absolutely. Uh, you know, when we voted a while back on the enhancement calendar, we never know whether we're going to get things right or get things wrong, but we hope we do the right thing. And when I attended the stakeholders meeting at South Smithfield Elementary and heard this presentation, then uh, you didn't get to see Miss Mackey in full-blown uh, enthusiasm and crying like she did at the uh, stakeholders meeting, but there was so much passion there, and uh, I left there and I thought, we got this one right. Yeah. So uh, thank you both so much for your presentations, for your enthusiasm, your staff, the enthusiasm they have, and, you know, we got this right, and we just appreciate so much your efforts in making this happen. Absolutely. Uh, Dr. Renfrew. Uh, Ms. Bryant, Ms. Uh, Makey, thank you both uh, for being outstanding lead learners. Um, we look forward to partnering with you on the journey. Uh, this will make an impact in a positive way uh, on each student's success. I have uh, charged uh, Dr. Price and his team. You know, there was concern about, you know, how, you know, how are we going to measure this? Is this going to be successful? And so Dr. Price will bring a... Uh, a rubric in January to the board meeting uh, that shows you know what we're looking for in terms of deliverables at West Smithfield and South Smithfield so that we can give you reports on a regular basis of how AVID is working at West Smithfield and how IB will be working in what we're looking for at South Smithfield so just an addendum to that very good thank you Dr. Renfro Dolores Gill Thank you, Dr. Price. Good afternoon, Chairman Wooten, Vice Chair Johnson, members of the board. Ms. Gill, can I interrupt one second? Absolutely. Um, I'd like to recognize Dr. Price of his 50th birthday is today. So. <laughs> That uh, he has invited us all down for cake in his office, or are you going to bring that in, Doctor Price? Could you? I'll leave that down there. Okay. <laughs> cake at home. <laughs> Mind wearing that hat for the rest of the board meeting? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. With you. <laughs> Those who need to leave, feel free to to leave. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. For 20, 21 years. Wow. That was so good. Okay, Ms. Gill. Sorry about that. Not a problem at all. Again, good afternoon, Chairman Wooten, Vice Chair Johnson, members of the board, and Mr. Lawrence. Um, today I have five items to bring before you for approval and one item for information. First item is Board Exhibit 10C1, Policy 3435, Student Accountability. Policy 3435 was amended in October of 2017. The policy has continued to be amended to remain in compliance with our legislative requirements and the vision of our district as it relates to student promotion and accountability. 
Academic innovation teams of personnel have taken a detailed look at this overall policy and the language has been update, updated to reflect our current practices related to student promotion and accountability. The language clearly reflects what principals and schools are doing. Growth as a measure of standards for promotion have been added as well as clear language throughout the policy as it relates to intervention planning. High school weights are clearly defined as well as the promotion review process. The policy has been further revised to focus on the responsibility of parents or custodial adults in cases where the parent's not in place. The policy reflects clear language for schools as they work with students and stakeholders. And upon the recommendation of the Policy Review Committee and academic information, Policy 3435 is presented today for approval. Policy 3435, student accountability, this is, this is an action item. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Well, I, I should ask, are there any questions about it before I... <laughs> or a motion. Or a motion. Okay. <laughs> I, I entertain a motion. How about that? Second. <laughs> motion by Ronald Johnson. <laughs> second by Butler Hall. Now, are there any questions? Uh, all those in favor? Uh -huh. All those opposed? Motion now carries 7 0. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. The next item is Board Exhibit 10 C2, Policy 3400 Grading. Policy 3400 was last amended in September of 2016. This policy is routinely amended as our district continues to implement standards-based grading. Policy 3400 has been amended to specifically add fourth grade students who are now involved in standards-based grading. An amendment has been made also to add that an exception will be made for seniors who are graduating at the end of the current semester. This allows schools to make graduation decisions in a timely manner. Upon the recommendation of Policy Review Committee and Academic Information Innovation, Policy 3400 is presented today for approval. Entertain a motion for Policy so, 3400. Uh, motion by Todd Sutton, seconded by Ronald Johnson. Any questions? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries 7 0. Our next item is Board Exhibit 10 C3. It's a proposed new policy, the Code of Ethics and Responsibility for School Board Members. As we continue to refine our policy manual with suggestions from our Policy Review Committee, stakeholders, and as well as guidance from the North Carolina School Boards Association, additional policies are considered. The following proposed policy is a sample from the association and a policy the committee believes will enhance the work of the board. The proposed policy details for board members ethical requirements and board commitments. The policy ensures that the Code of Ethics annual statement, ethics statement is signed annually. The following language to the proposed policy is presented in accordance with legal references and language and upon the recommendation of Policy Review Committee, the Code of a Board Member Ethics Policy is presented today <coughs> for approval. Entertain a motion for Code of Ethics. I'll move. Motion by Teresa Grant, second by Ronald Johnson. Any questions? Uh, just one quick statement, Mr. Chairman. This is, this is legislation. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, thanks for all the policy committee did on that. You got to do Mr. it. Mr. Lawrence. <laughs> and Mr. Lawrence. He carried, he, he carried the water on this one. Any other questions? <coughs> all those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries 7 0. Ms. Gill. Our next item is Board Exhibit 10 C4, Policy 1540 board member conflict of interest. Policy 1540 was adopted in February of 2011. There are new legislative requirements which prompts us to make the recommended changes to the existing policy. The amendments suggested to policy 1540 <coughs> include additions to item two, which adds that a board member has a conflict of interest when the board member will obtain a direct benefit from the contract. Item four is added to the <coughs> policy which states that gifts or favors from any person or group desiring to do or doing business with a school system is a conflict of interest unless these gifts are instructional products <coughs> or advertising items of nominal value that are widely distributed. And finally, item five states that a board member shall not solicit or accept any gifts from any potential provider of E-rate services or products 
in violation of our federal gifting rules. Upon the recommendation of policy review, policy 1540, board member code of ethics is presented today for approval. Entertain a motion for policy 1540, board member conflict of interest. So move. Second. Uh, Motion by Todd. Yeah, I heard motion by Ronald making, Johnson. Making to seconds. Motion by seconds. I hope you read it. Todd, <laughs> I did. It's your responsibility to read it. And this is another change by yeah. law, right? Yes, Mr. Uh -huh. Lawrence. I, All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries 7 0. The next item is Board Exhibit 10 C5, a proposed <laughs> policy confidentiality with board members. Again, as we continue to refine our policy manual with suggestions from the Policy Review Committee, our stakeholders, and the North Carolina School Boards Association, additional policies are considered. The following proposed policy is a sample from the association, and the Policy Committee believes this will enhance the work. The following proposed policy details the work of the board as it pertains to confidential information discussed. It further details confidentiality in closed session. The following language to the proposed policy is presented in according with appropriate legal references and language and is presented today for approval. Um, entertain a motion for confidential information for board members. I move, I move that we accept that. Okay. Motion. Uh, motion by Vice Chair Johnson, seconded by Dr. Smith. Any questions about this policy? I just want to make a comment contracts come under this confidentiality real estate transactions those kinds of things by law we are obligated to do those in closed session if you read some media sometimes you get the impression that it's secretive and that we're doing something behind closed doors that we shouldn't be doing those things are required by law and I just want to make that clear because sometimes the misinterpretation is out there and I just wanted to clarify that we are following our own policy which follows state board policy which follows state law and you need to really understand that because if what what is said in closed session cannot be discussed with anyone that's right no one otherwise I wanted to beat me to Clayton <laughs> and we we have to announce what actions are taken that's all but that's it mm -hmm. well it's our job as board members to make sure we read these policies not just when we're changing them, but read them every year. I mean, it's year. you just need to follow it. That's right. Any other questions? All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries 7 0. Thank you. And my final item is a board exhibit 10 C6. Um, we are pleased today to have Synergistics um, here from all the way from Texas. Johnston County Public Schools is utilizing the Ener Energy Conservation Program from Synergistics, which seeks to avoid energy costs in the district. Representatives from the company are here today to provide you an update as well as status reports since beginning to serve our district. Uh, today, I'd like to make just a few introductions. Um, first, I'd like to um, introduce to you the boots on the ground individuals who are our three energy specialists. Uh, first, uh, Mr. Mike Vincent, uh, Ms. Sarah Conway, and Mr. Miles Moody. And we thank them, thank you so much. We thank them for being in our schools and working to implement the program and um, working very diligently in our district. We also have today uh, Mr. Butch Collier. Uh, Butch is um, the person who is with us very often, flying down at least two, sometimes three times a month uh, from Texas to work uh, both with our uh, HVAC folks as well as to uh, bring in additional folks from their engineers and, and their teams. And we thank you for being here today as well. And then joining me up front, and I'm going to turn uh, the presentation over to this gentleman, is Mr. Kent Hess. He is, and I failed to mention, uh, Mr. Collier is one of our vice presidents uh, as an energy consultant with Synergistics, as well as we have Mr. Kent Hess with us today, who is also a vice president, energy consultant with Synergistics. We're pleased to have you and give us an update. Right, thank you. I'll turn it over to you. Welcome, Mr. Hess. Yes, sir. Thank you. I appreciate the, uh, uh, Ms. Gill and the, the board allowing us to be here today. Our, our goal really is to give you a, 
a broad overview of the work that uh, uh, we've accomplished here. Uh, been in contract almost two years now. Uh, the, uh, the partnership began, I believe, in January of 16. I've been actively involved in Johnson since last February as your measurement and verification lead or your data guy, however you want to word that, <coughs> and uh, just really happy to be here. Uh, during that time, we've uh, gotten the three energy specialists here on board. They've done quite a bit of work, but our goal is uh, several goals, but two of the main ones are right there on the top. Um, we want to reduce and eliminate the energy waste in the district, and we want to do that at the same time by maintaining comfort in the classroom. Um, I'm a former teacher myself, uh, spent nearly 28 years as a high school math teacher, and so there's no best interest in, in, in uh, you know, doing something that would negatively impact a classroom. We always want a positive impact on the environment there, so that's a, 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 a utmost concern to us. And I know that uh, Miles and Mike and um, Sarah do a, 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 a lot of time uh, dealing with comfort complaints if, if they arise. Um, their role, if you try to describe what they do, it's sort of hard to do that on a one-page slide. Um, but I will tell you what some of their expectations are. Uh, we, we, they probably spend about 80% of their time out in buildings. Um, much of that time when buildings are unoccupied. Our main focus is when buildings are unoccupied. That's our, that's our biggest opportunity for savings, is setting back buildings when there's nobody there. So uh, you, you might see them during the occupied time as well when they're, they're doing some of their work, but they might be in buildings when the rest of us might uh, be home or in bed or, you know, doing something else on the weekend. Um, the rest of those are listed right there, but uh, the way that we are able to tell if we're successful is we, we track data. Uh, I'm a measurement and verification guy. Um, it's the data. Uh, the idea here is, is if, if I could try to simplify it as best as I can without getting into the weeds, is we know how we used energy before we started the contract, and we know how we use energy afterwards. And we're doing really what amounts to before and after. Are we using less electric? Are we using less natural gas? Are we using less propane? If we are, we know we save. We use a third-party software program called Energy Cap. Energy Cap is its own separate company. These, this company is located in Pennsylvania. It's third party. They follow the international standards on how you do measurement and verification. As a starting point, as an MMD guy, I like to look at how we use energy before the program began. So what we have up there on that slide is 12 months of consumption, <laughs> raw data from Johnson County. It details the amount of electric that you used, natural gas, it will show you what you're uh, paying. It will tell you what your overall spend is. That slide, I have one later on that will show you the last 12 months, the most recent 12 months, and it should provide you a nice comparison, I believe, in terms of what are we using now and what are we spending now versus what we were doing two years ago. But before that, just a couple quick slides. Uh, <laughs> Again, high-level view, uh, uh, trends on uh, electric consumption, raw electric consumption. The blue line represents that base year, the 12 months before the contract was signed. The red line, I believe that is, is, a, uh, is the first year of the program. And then we've got the grayish, ugly line that is uh, 2017. <coughs> we have the same slide for natural <coughs> gas. Um, you'll notice natural gas, we use a lot more there in... Uh, in January and February, that's weather related. Um, I did, I'm gonna back this thing up a little bit. I forgot to mention with uh, your base year, um, and I'm not sure you can really see it on this slide, so if you can't, that pie graph that's on the far right, that is actually a, a picture of your utility spend, and that big blue part is electric. So we know that electric is about 80% of the cost to the district. So that's where our focus is, is mainly, is on the electric. We know that's the biggest opportunity. So we save money by using less, right? We, we, we use more, we're going to spend more. We use less, we're going to spend less. So cost avoidance is the value of that energy that we're not using. And to date, from January of 16 all the way through September of 17, 
we just eclipsed the, the $2 million mark. If you look at this on a month-by-month -month cumulative, uh, I, I provided a slide there. Uh, of note is the little red left-to-right arrow. And that is a, a, a segment of time that we like to call the quick start. Uh, and what's important there is during the quick start period, uh, we operate on a shared savings, but during the quick start period, uh, the district was not billed for that. So the savings that you see there, about 300 and some thousand dollars, uh, that, was, that was all went to Johnson County. <coughs> you can see on this slide uh, where the dollars are coming from. Uh, on my slide, that actually lines up a lot prettier than it does on this one, but that's okay if you can sort of follow that down. But just like uh, I mentioned that electric is the biggest be our biggest saver. And if you take a look at the numbers there, you'll notice that about 80% of the savings is coming from the electric side. This slide I mentioned earlier is, a, uh, is a, again, a raw data. Uh, Energy Cap takes into account program variances that we can't control, like changes in the weather. Um, if you're building new, uh, square, adding square footage to a building, if we've had mechanical changes, the software program can take care of that. But every once in a while, it's just nice to go back and say, well, what's, what are the raw dollars? So you'll notice this slide here. If you compare that back to the other slide, I think you'll see a nice, healthy reduction in your raw costs and your raw use. So over 16 million kilowatt hours of electric <coughs> saved. Um, 124,000 therms of gas. Not too bad. Pretty good stuff. And also, there's a green effect, right, for, for an impact on the environment. Um, we're, re we're removing metric tons of CO2 into the um, atmosphere, uh, the equivalent of moving, uh, removing over 2,000 cars from the roads over a, a one-year period. You might recognize the Energy Star logo. Um, what you may not know is that buildings can get labeled as Energy Star buildings just like a f refrigerator can get, not the same way, but it's the same labeling <coughs> process, if you will, that the refrigerator gets if it's energy efficient. In this case, when you receive an Energy Star label for a building, it puts you in the top 25% of most efficient buildings in, in that class in the country. And we're currently working on, on getting some of your buildings labeled. We think we might have, uh, I hate to throw a number until everything's official official, but we're thinking upwards uh, 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 north of 35. The uh, list there just gives you some things that the uh, uh, that Mike and Miles and Sarah have been working on and some of the successes that they've had. Um, the one thing that you'll see there in that second bullet is also the same thing as the future. Um, the Christmas season is upon us, which means buildings are going to be, in many cases, empty. And what we want to do is we want to manage those buildings um, well so that we're not heating spaces that nobody's using, lighting, classrooms where nobody's there to see it. And that's uh, a lot of planning and work on their time. So right now, that's uh, their main focus right now would be that upcoming Christmas break shutdown, or setback, I think, as we call it. We would like to thank the uh, school board and, and Dr. Renfro, uh, Dolores as well, for having us here today, and, but more importantly, for bringing the program in. We're happy to work with you. We've, we're pleased. I've enjoyed my, my time that I've been here over the last 10 months or so. Um, and just as a little caveat, I, I've got a granddaughter that lives about 45 minutes away, so when I come into this area and work, there's always a little perk for me. So <laughs> it's, it's all good news there. All right? I try to keep that uh, as short as I could and as informative as I could. Uh, just giving you a broad overview of the success. We think there's still more out there. We look forward to improving. And uh, you can always get another nickel, somebody told me once. So uh, we're looking for the, forward to doing that for you. Questions? Thank you. I got questions to one of the three. What's the most common energy saver when you're walking in schools and nobody's in the schools? What is it that you find the most common fault that you see that needs to be addressed, I guess? That's I, can sit, I was watching you guys' eyes and, and being a former educator, uh, <laughs> you look a little glassed over, you know, maybe tired or whatever. <laughs> I'm going to break down to layman's term. Uh, we are a conservation company that focuses upon comfort. And I have uh, two of my principals over here that I'm very blessed. <laughs> I serve 15 <laughs> schools, and I have some great administrators, great staff, great custodians, miracles every day. 
or to answer your questions, we're in the buildings doing daytime hours and doing unoccupied time, trying to find opportunities to make the environment more comfortable for the daytime. That's our primary focus. And two of my principals over here, they are very uh, uh, actually involved, make sure their <laughs> classrooms are <laughs> tolerable and comfortable for their <laughs> teachers. <laughs> and uh, uh, encouragement and guidance. <laughs> 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 to diagnose the situation <laughs> and uh, to give, give them data as to what has happened in your classroom <laughs> and then trying to work with the facility service with uh, the facility service with Rocky Johnson and all the tech guys who are like firemen. <laughs> They're trying to put out fires every day and they do a wonderful job in Johnson County Schools and they need a lot of uh, help uh, a lot of guidance and some accountability and some miracles. <laughs> but uh, we have um, a great system here, uh, but we do have uh, a lots of room for improvement. Mm -hmm. And uh, saving opportunities are awesome, off the chart. And I listened to uh, Dr. Price's uh, presentation there about the additional goals and needs and the AVID program. I was very involved in that, the Triple S and other programs, back what programs, they cost money. And we hope that through this opportunity of cost avoidance, we can help you to spend, instead of money on utilities, spend it on instructions and creative programs. And so I'm excited uh, about the opportunity we have to serve. And the sky is the limit. And what we need from Synergistics is support uh, that we can offer suggestions. We have a great resource of personnel in Dallas that can help to tweak the procedure operation. Uh, for example, the ice storage, uh, the fan core units, the air handling units, why they run like they are. Can we run them more efficiently? Uh, can they be more productive? In our classrooms, why are they not uh, warm or too cold? And how, what can we do? And so we have a great resource. And to answer your question, I'm in the building nighttime. I'm a nighttime guy. I'm in the building from 7 o'clock to about 2 or 3 in the mornings, and I'm walking the buildings, uh, and I'm just trying to find out what is running, what is not running. Why are the exhaust fans bringing in outside air? And why in the summertime are we bringing in too much humidity early on in the day? And we're trying to find the right time to start the units up so we don't bring in the too much outside air because that must be conditioned. There's a lot of... Uh, a lot of qualities you must address. And uh, we just need your support to trust us because we will be part of, the, part of the solution. And we're not the enemy. You know, I love John Scanner School. My daughter teaches at High School. She's like her father. She's off the chain, too. She just <laughs> loves it. Uh, but, you know, uh, I, like I think that this really before. helped. We've I feel like I've heard this speech before. Got it? Yeah. <laughs> but thank you very much for you know, your support. And, John's Cat School is awesome, and uh, Synergist can really help you. We need a trust factor. And we'll be glad to answer your question. I invite you to go with me on an audit anytime you like. I just need walk. your mobile number. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank y'all very much. Uh, any other questions? Is that, is that all you had, Ms. Gill? Thank, Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. There is um, an item seven. Yes, that there is an item seven. Do you want to address that, or Mr. Lawrence want to address it? I believe that? I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Lawrence okay. on this particular. Mr. Lawrence. Right in the corner of the Falcon School property. 
Oh, for yeah. clarification, it's a power line easement, right? It is Correct? a power line. Okay. Power line easement. Okay. <clears throat> um, and, there, and there is already some power lines there. Okay. You've heard the uh, easement for the town of Clayton. Uh, entertain a motion. To move. Motion yeah. by Butler Hall, second by Todd Sutton. Any questions? It's currently lines going through the same easement. So uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries 7 0. Mr. Petrano, thank you, Ms. Gill. Thank you. I have two items for you this afternoon. One item is in action the other is information the first item exhibit 10 d1 is the 2018-19 calendar proposal on behalf of the calendar committee i'm delighted to present our calendar proposal for the 2018-19 school year before providing some information on the calendar proposal i would like to take an opportunity to publicly thank the committee members for their time and service uh, those who are here, if you would please stand. <coughs> that may be everyone else who's left. <laughs> <laughs> so these 43 individuals represent various employee groups, such as teachers, counselors, teacher assistants, principals, assistant principals, office support, and central office staff. The committee also includes some students, parents, and members of the community. The calendar committee met several times and reviewed 17 possible calendars. Of those, two calendars, sample calendars, were created and posted on our school system website. After reviewing the feedback received from the website and engaging in much discussion, the committee developed the calendar proposal for your consideration and approval. As a reminder, general statute does outline the requirements for the development of school calendars. For example, school may begin for students no earlier than the Monday closest to August 26th. In 2018, the Monday closest to August 26th is August 27th. Also, school may end for students no later than Friday, than the Friday closest to June 11th. For the 18-19 school year, the Friday closest to June 11th is June 14th. The calendar must have a minimum of 185 student days or 1,025 hours. It must have 11 holidays and 10 annual leave days, and then must contain a total of 215 days. While there was some support <coughs> for a more traditional calendar, um, like we currently are working within now, there was overwhelming support in, of the proposal that is being shared with you today. <coughs> uh, Kay Gardner has been through this process many times, um, right behind me over here on my right, <laughs> and I'm not sure if we've ever had as much feedback on one particular positive feedback on one particular calendar as we did this year. Wow. So as one calendar committee member stated, this calendar reflects our district's desire to be innovative. Mm -hmm. That's one of the words behind us now, innovation. Mm -hmm. I would like to share some of the highlights of the proposed calendar. Prior to the first student day, there are 10 work days. The first week of work days will be designated as optional work days and will be used for district-led professional learning. The second week of work days will be reserved for the school. The first day of school for students is Monday, August 27th. There's a holiday on September 3rd for Labor Day. The first nine week period ends October 19th with a work day on November 1st. Uh, the decision to move that work day later was based <coughs> on stakeholder feedback. There was much support for having that work day the day after Halloween. There's a holiday on November 12th for Veterans Day. There continues to be much support for a three-day break at Thanksgiving. Therefore, November 21st is coded as an annual leave day. There also continues to be 
overwhelming support for a two-week break during the Christmas holidays. So you will find that in this calendar. There's a holiday on, Jan on yes, January 1st for New Year's. January 2nd is coded as an annual leave day. And work days are scheduled on January 3rd and 4th since the semester ends on the 21st. And I will be inviting in just a few moments Dr. Price to come up to the podium and share some comments on the advantages of the semester ending mm -hmm. prior to the, it. the Christmas break. That is a it. huge change for us with this calendar and the Much many needed advantages change. that change. you will touch on. There's a holiday on January 21st for Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. A teacher work day on February 18th, which is also President's Day. <coughs> Third nine week period ends March 8th with a work day on the 11th. Spring break is April 19th through the 26th. There's a holiday on May 27th for Memorial Day. The last day of school for students is May 30th. I'm not sure how long it's been since we've said last day of school <laughs> in May. <laughs> um, this allows time for high schools to prepare for graduation on May 31st. And there are six work days at the end of the school year. The proposed inclement weather days are November 1st, February 18th, March 11th, May 31st and April 26th. <coughs> At this time, as I mentioned earlier, I would like to invite Dr. Price to come up and join me to comment on the significance of the semester ending prior to Christmas break. Other than we would have been uh, tarred and feathered had we not, because the, it was uh, the committee, this was the first time that I've been a part of it that everyone was um, really committed to, to making this happen. Um, I'll talk just a minute about uh, less about the the benefits because the big benefit is for high school obviously re retention of information and not having to go you know hold that until after uh, the the break and and then coming back in January. But remember that we take two weeks off and then we come back and some kids are exempt from exams mm -hmm. and it gives the appearance that we're out of school forever. And parents come to the board and say keep the kids in school during January. <laughs> find something for them to do even if they're not taking tests, and we understand that. So one of the benefits will be retention. The other will be uh, the fact that we have the break and then we come back, um, you know, uh, with a, a, a fresh start to a semester. Uh, the, the piece that some people were concerned about um, was that the disparity in the semesters when you're looking at 11 or 12 days. But that's misleading because in the past, if you look at the trend, we have a disparity of five or six days, which is far less. But the second semester usually has less days. They have five or six less days. That's when we have inclement weather. So if we're forgiving about three days, that increases to about nine days. So the disparity at the end of the year when you go back and look at it is not as um, great as it is on paper. So. Um, just want to say that I'm excited about it, uh, as as were a lot of people. As, um, well, just to make it simple, the exams will be taken before Christmas break. That is that simple. Sir. Yeah, yes, that's a I, good thing. I have two two questions. Um, one one's a comment, and the other's a question. Okay. Yeah. Students <laughs> can now begin college. They don't have to sit out spring semester. They can actually start mm -hmm. because they're graduating in December. It's excellent. Second question, this, this is my first question. School opening day, always in the past, that very first work day, everybody assembled at the school for the big kickoff for the year. When is that day in this calendar? So the first week of work days, and that's something that we talked about in our calendar committee, those will be optional work days. There was some concern about asking teachers to come back that first week, it's maybe some veteran teachers. And so, based on the feedback that we received from our stakeholders, we felt the need to identify, designate that first week as optional work day. We feel certain that many of our teachers and employees will take advantage of the district-led professional development, but they will not be required work days. The required so the work big, days will be the second week. The big hurrah at the school for setting the tone and doing all that will actually be that second Monday. Yes, just want to make that clear. I got one question. Um, as as uh, 
husband of a teacher that let her look over this calendar and, and one of the items, you answered two of them, but is it safe to say that on the last day, May 30th, that is an early dismissal or are we going, is that a full day? Our practice tradition has been early dismissal. Um, certainly, I, I'm sure the superintendent will, will hear your comments on that, but our practice has been early dismissal on the last day of school. Congratulations. And graduation is the 31st. Yes, Question. Why, why this calendar this year instead of last year or five years ago? <laughs> Which, honest, it's a honest, great calendar. I like it. Yeah. To be honest with you, um, there are many who feel very comfortable about staying on the path that we've been on. That Sometimes there's comfort in that. And uh, we talk about this sometimes. Sometimes we, we fight ghosts um, and, and we present ourselves with challenges that when we really delve sure. into it, they're challenges that we can overcome. And so I think that why we haven't done it in the past, maybe we just haven't been as innovative as, as we are now. Maybe we haven't um, been as willing to take risks to do it think is best for children. It's a great move. But again, as I commented earlier, one of our <clears throat> members when we were in the one of the last meetings said that we are living up to what we are putting on these walls around here. And that one of those is being innovative. Good deal. And and I I will tell you as many um, years as we have had exams after Christmas, I hear from parents and community wasted time. Mm. We can't afford to waste. I understand we may have a longer semester, but that is less wasted time than those two weeks when we came back. It, it, it's just compliments to the chef. This is a great menu. <laughs> so going back, Mr. Hall, I mean, might there be some, some, some challenges with this? Absolutely. We've mm. talked about those, but I think we have a commitment from our principals, especially mm. our high school principals. To, to work um, right. to address those challenges and to do what's best for students. I think the benefits outweigh the Absolutely. challenges. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. If I may, just one other thing, just in your talking point, uh, the high school, uh, our AP teachers are very, very appreciative because mm -hmm. AP exams are given in the first weeks of May, mm -hmm. and they've been starting those classes in late January, and now they'll be able to start three weeks earlier, mm -hmm. which hopefully we'll also see an improvement in our AP scores because we'll have more opportunities to get That's just another point. That's a great point. Great. 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 Thanks to the committee. Thank you. This is an action item. Yeah. You've heard the information, uh, entertaining. Uh, so we've already got a motion by Vice Chair Johnson. Second. Then. Second by Butler Hall. I mean, sure Any that other questions about the calendar? This, <laughs> <laughs> this was my baby, okay? <laughs> Great. Here's your motion. We got a second by Butler Hall. Mm -hmm. All those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries 7 0. Thank you for everybody's work on that. Thank you. The next item is an information item, exhibit number 10 D2 School start, start Time Survey Results. Wanted to provide you with an update as to where we are. But I want to take you back and give you a little history and remind us why we are here today. As some of you may recall, at the June 2016 board meeting, Parker Watson, then a high school senior <coughs> at LS, presented some research on school start times and urged the board to consider the impact start times on high schools may be having on student achievement. Not only student achievement, but teen driving as well. In response to Parker's presentation, a school start time task force was created. This task force gathered research on how school start times impact students. The two research findings on this slide are just a sampling of research that was gathered. After receiving a summary of findings last spring, this Board of Education supported the recommendation to issue surveys. During the week of November 13th, surveys were offered to students, parents, 
and staff. You can see in this slide that about 37% of our middle and high school students participated, a little over than 7,000. About 35% of parents, and that's if you say that there's an average of two students per household, uh, more than 6,000 parents. And then more than 2,500 staff, or about 58% of staff members participated in the survey. <clears throat> One of the survey questions asked respondents whether they believed a later start time would have a positive impact, negative impact, or no impact. As you can see in this slide, more <coughs> students and staff selected a positive impact than negative or no impact. A higher percentage of parents did choose negative impact than positive or no impact. When asked how teen drivers would be impacted, all three groups, students, staff, and parents, had a higher percentage who selected positive impact than negative or no impact. <clears throat> we asked all three groups if they would support a shift in school start times that included high school and middle school students starting later and elementary students starting at an earlier time. As you can see, more students, 51%, stated yes, that they would support a later start time. Most staff, 68%, stated yes, they would support. Parents were divided with 52% stating <coughs> no. So we wanted to look further into that information. So the next few slides include data by high school attendance area. And what you will find is there are differences in how people feel uh, among these high school attendance areas. The first slide you can see Corinth Holders High. More students and parents in this area support a later start time. The Clayton High School area, more students support a later start time compared to more parents who do not. Smithfield Selma area, almost an even split among parents, but there are more students in this area who do not support it. The South Johnston High School area, a higher percentage of students and parents um, in this area did not support the later start time. North Johnston High School and Princeton areas, uh, more students and parents in these two areas uh, did not support a later start time. West Johnston High School, a higher percentage of students and parents support a later start time. And then Cleveland High School, 53% of parents did not support while 55% of the students do. So the research is clear, and based on survey results, more students and staff support a shift in school start times. While 52% of parents responded that they did not support a shift in school start times, there are some high school attendance areas where more parents do support a later start time for high school and middle school students. I want to remind you of Parker's comments from June of 2016. Here's what she said. Decisions should be based on students' best interest academically. If we continue to disregard the evidence relative to sleep deprivation among teens and remain focused on the economical, political, and social reasons of why they should not start school earlier, teens will continue to suffer. We know too much at this point to turn back now. The task force understands that even if we had 100% support today, it may not be reasonable to restructure all of our schedules for next year. The earliest we recommend is the 2019-20 school year. But while this is only an information item, I wanted to make you aware that I've recommended to our superintendent and now to this board that we engage families in additional discussion at our kitchen table events 
especially since there are differing levels of support among the high school attendance areas. I'm excited about the results. Again, overall, students, more students and more staff support a later start time. And parents are about divided, 52% not in favor, 48% in favor. But I think at this point, we need to continue to have the conversation and move in this direction. I think he brings up a good point of it's, it's going to be a great topic to share in the kitchen table discussions with all the stakeholders when we're meeting them face to face because there's a lot of examples of why we should and there's a lot of examples of why we shouldn't. So I think we need to go as board members, we need to listen in to all the stakeholders and <coughs> make an opinion upon, you know, all the data we collect out in the community. So. Uh, it's nothing that's got to be voted on tonight, but it's a, it's a great topic and something that we got to consider. Dr. Renfrew? Dr. Smith. Dr. Elementary Smith. children didn't vote. This was just <coughs> voted on by students from what grades to what grades? Uh, middle school, high school. Okay. So taking into account athletics, child care by older siblings looking after younger siblings, younger children being out in the dark in the mornings waiting on buses. Mm -hmm. What are the possibilities of shifting the day? You know what I'm, you know what I'm asking? Instead of shifting around, why not just move the whole day from eight to five as work days go? I, I'm just throwing that out as something to think about mm -hmm. because I, I have neighbors who have three children who are in elementary school and their provider is a high school student. What we found and what I think you, what you're saying, Dr. Smith, is take our current schedule and just push it back. What the research <coughs> says that the task force found was that in order to see the full effects, you really have to move high school well beyond where it is now. Um, you would really have to push it back much further a 30 minute difference in time is, is not going to make the difference that I think this board would want to see if we move forward in this direction. And so that's why we made the recommendation that, that we did. But we did have elementary teachers, elementary um, <coughs> parents that completed this survey as well and certainly had opportunity to share um, their input in the, in the process, but, but certainly I think at this point we're looking at all options. The previous presentation, <coughs> Mr. Hall asked, why haven't we done this before? <coughs> I think a few years from now, we might be asking ourselves, why didn't we do this several years ago? Um, it's real easy to identify all the challenges, <coughs> athletics, family schedules, child care, um, but, you know, my feeling and, and speaking on the, the task force, when the research is clear that this has a positive impact on student achievement and the safety of our students, teen driving, that the responsibility is on us to identify the challenges, which I think we can easily do, but then say, how do we address those challenges to still move forward in this direction, knowing that this is what we need to do for our students? So I, I know that there are challenges that there they're, um, certainly have been shared with us, but the research that we've seen also has suggested that those districts have been able to overcome those challenges and that the community has, a, has adapted and has become flexible with the changing schedules within the school. <coughs> but we are willing to take any suggestions that this body has and our community. I, I think I had said this before, what are the possibilities of combining schools that are close to each other so that, that the spread is not so great? Um, McGee's Elementary Middle, Cleveland Elementary Middle, that's just another thought. When you say combining students, you mean on a bus? Yes. Okay. That their their times would be ten minutes apart instead of as they are now, like forty minutes apart. 
because the buses are having to run two routes. The elementary children come after the delivery of the middle school students. Correct me if I'm wrong, but you said that moving the time schedule 30 minutes would not get the desired results that we want. Did you, is that my correct in repeating that? Based on the research okay. that if right now, if we look at seven o'clock, uh, Mr. Jones, 7.15, if we were to just push it to 7.45, what the research says is that's still not a significant change enough for, to see a positive effect on student achievement at the high school level. What does the research say is a significant amount of time to make the effect we want? I believe that most of the research said supported 8.30 or after oh. for high school start times. That would put school getting out at what time? Roughly. Uh, 7.15, we get out now at 2 o'clock. 3.30. So we were starting. Mm -hmm. Elementary children don't get out at 3.30, and they start at 8.30. Those children are getting out at 4, 4.10. Right. Yeah. Okay. I just had numerous emails come to me with concerns similar to what Dr. Smith was talking about, child care, um, at the bus stop way before dawn for an elementary student. Um, other comments were, you know, we, we see and read the data, but we know our teenage kids, they're going to stay up an hour later if they go in an hour later in the day. Um, so, you know, I like to hear that we're going to do it at the kitchen round table meetings and have more conversation with our stakeholders. But because I think that um, some even mentioned that some of the questions were kind of misleading them or having them focused on answering one way where the when the data came out it wasn't really what their answer was but it was kind of persuading them into that arena of maybe more to the yes side and i'm just um basing this on the comments i've got via email but um i do like the fact that we're going to have more conversations about this because there is a lot of concern out there from uh some that have high school students that may take their middle school child to to school um, and, and different things, I mean, it's uh, elementary as well, so, or leaving them at home while they go to work and their kids are still at home. Well, thank you for your comments. As far as the survey, we looked at other surveys that have been uh, administered by other school systems and we used that as a, as a starting point. But, um, you know, certainly we, we tried to be as neutral as, as we could be um, with, with the surveys, but. I, and speaking candidly, Mr. Vetrano, I haven't, dealt with anyone and these are people contacting me they're self-initiating this and they're pointing out all the challenges with it like you said but I haven't heard anyone in favor of this and like I said these are people taking a proactive stance for whatever reason however I do encourage if anybody's watching or if anybody has input to contact us and let us know all seven of us because this is a big change for people yeah. and while they are some benefits to be reaped we have to look at practicality we have to look at sporting events, like Dr. Smith said, ban. There's just so much that we can do. I mean, we look at, we, you know, Synergistics was in here, was talking about cost efficiency and how we're saving money to make JOCO 2020 happen. So we need to weigh out everything. And I would encourage anybody, if they're watching on the live stream or if anybody knows anyone who has concerns about this or says this is what we need to do, we need to hear their voices too. I agree. And I think that's why we're taking a lot of time with this. We've Absolutely. had this task force in place for over a year. Yeah. And I also wanted to remind us that this was initiated not because of a central office administrator who wanted to share his own thoughts and opinions. This was a result of one of our own students yeah. coming to this board room and yeah. sharing research that she had done and sharing with you her beliefs on what we needed to do for children. And as a result, that's why we're here today. But, but thank you for your, your thoughts and suggestions. And we will continue to receive those and try to make the best decisions and present you with information so that you can help guide and advise us in making the best decisions as we move forward. Yeah, and he makes a good point. I think it, we as board members need to keep an open mind, listen to what the stakeholders have to say, go through the kitchen table discussions and get all the yeah. feedback we can to make a decision. And, and you know, let's be fair to everybody and let them, let them state the case and, and we can make our decision on what the data yeah. presents. So. I appreciate your time with this. We've Two things, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think it is prudent for those people in attendance and watching 
to know that uh, our Board of Education did not initiate this conversation. In my role as Deputy Superintendent, we had two students come and said, why won't you at least study this? Right. Then as a superintendent, we had an additional student. So over the last four or five years, we've had three students come and stand at that podium and say, whether you do it or not, why won't you at least consider it? So what we have done as a Board of Education and superintendent is say, you're right, we should study this to see whether or not the benefits for student learning and achievement could be impacted by this. Secondly, and Brian may correct me if I'm wrong, but in my um, layman's analysis of the data he provided, uh, I calculated that maybe about 25% of our parent stakeholders responded or participated in uh, the survey. That's why I challenged Brian to say, we need to re-engage our stakeholders because for us to even to think about making a decision of that magnitude that you know, you've mentioned out, you don't want to do it with 25% of your folks. You like for it to be 75% of your folks. So the, uh, the total number of respondents was uh, concerning that you know, we need to really talk to people more and get more people's impact because it could skew, you know, it could shift, maybe overwhelmingly more people are in favor or overwhelmingly more people are against it. So. Those are the two things. I applaud you for being proactive and saying, we need to look at this because our students have said, uh, please look at this. And then, you know, my concern, you know, you always want consensus to move forward, but if consensus is only 25% of the whole part, that's really not consensus to move forward. There's a lot of folks that were not engaged in this and that's no fault of the committee or the task, task force. We just gotta figure out a way to get people to respond to it as we move forward into the spring. Mr. Vetrano, a high school senior, could have came in and said the same thing you did, and we would have stood up and clapped. But since you are here, we were throwing the hard questions at I you. Understand. So I appreciate <laughs> your I appreciate your patience and your candor. In Absolutely. This. And as we reach back out, if we uh, let people know that uh, the initial response leans towards a later start time, you might get more response. <laughs> you know, sometimes that's a driving factor. Here, fill out this survey. No, I'm not going to do that. You start seeing results that you don't agree with, and you hear that, you might be a little more motivated to fill out that survey next time or Four. whatever. It's a phone survey or a written survey? No, these were electronic surveys that were <laughs> sent to all staff, um, sent to all students through their school system email account. For parents, um, it was they could go online and complete the survey, or we had hard copies at every school that they could complete. Thank you, Mr. Thank Petrano. You. Appreciate it. <laughs> Ms. Roberts. Can we take a break, Mr. Chairman? We're almost done. We're almost done. Are we? No. Good afternoon or good evening again. As I ask our student services officer, Ray Stott, to come to the podium, I just want to leave you with a call to action because our dropout uh, data uh, will be presented for 2016 17. Mm -hmm. But October is National Dropout Prevention Month. But as you know, this is a year round effort for us, and we deploy many people to help with that. So our call to action is that if you know of anyone who is at risk of dropping out or has dropped out, please let us know because we want to recapture our students. Mr. Stott. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Merry Christmas. <laughs> it's always a pleasure to be with you, especially when I'm bringing good news. Uh, I think it's great news. Um, I think... Um, Use this. Like you're doing all right. Device. Yes, Wacker, sir. Can you get me on the? The right one. So, the right one. Thank you. What is a dropout? It's pretty counterintuitive, but um, it's basically someone who starts school and doesn't finish it. But there's some caveats in there um, because we have students who finished last year and just don't show back up this year and we don't know where they went. We refer to them as no-shows, and our student advocates 
uh, work really hard with our school social workers to search for those kids, but if we don't have them on the 20th day, they're a dropout for us. Um, also, uh, students who may leave us to go to a community college outside of Johnston, because we can only have an agreement with one system, and that's Johnston Community College. Even though they've enrolled there, they're a dropout for us. So even with that being said, um, I wanted to share with you uh, our five-year data uh, comparison. Uh, this is the rates for each high school in Johnston County. And you'll notice, uh, and they can fluctuate year to year from one school to another, but the big number, the number I want you to concentrate on is that Johnson County number at the bottom on the right-hand side. Uh, last three years, we have uh, <coughs> decreased our dropout rate, and we're very pleased with that. This year, 1.38. The reason that North Carolina number is not there, uh, those numbers don't officially, uh, aren't officially approved until um, February by the state board. And so maybe I'll have the opportunity in March to come back and show some comparison numbers and how we do compared to some of the systems around us. But one, uh, a rate of 1.38 is something to be uh, proud of. Also, those rates uh, translate to specific numbers. And again, last year, uh, we had 179 dropouts. This year, our number is 151. Way to go. Uh, and that is a, a great... Awesome. Um, great number and something to celebrate again. In addition to that, I want to share that 11, again, because of the way they um, add these numbers and how the statistics come out based on the rules that we have to play by, actually 11 of those students are dropouts for a second time. So a truer number is really 140 because our advocates, our social workers, our counselors, our principals, they go after kids, bring them back in. Unfortunately, life happens sometime, and there's another circumstance where they end up not completing and have to be counted as a dropout. So they've counted twice. And in some cases, we've had kids that counted three times as dropouts. But that's just the way the system works. So again, that 151 is a great number, but I think even a truer number is uh, 140 in the fact that some of those have dropped out multiple times. Dropouts by category, we've shared these uh, with you <coughs> traditionally out of 151, uh, 25 of those are English language learners, about 16%, exceptional children, uh, <coughs> and those folks in those areas are aware of that and working to, with us to reduce that, 51 at 33.8%. And traditionally, and this is not different than any other year, our males uh, outpace our female dropouts about two to one. And then just some statistics about our dropouts and uh, by grade, um, most of them, again, are ninth and 10th graders as they drop out. So it's so important uh, to have those wraparound services for our young uh, kids coming into high school from middle school. Uh, but you'll see ninth grade is 43, our <coughs> highest is 10th, but very close at 44. And then our dropouts by age. You can't drop out legally until you're 16, according to the state law, but uh, we have those three were uh, very close to their 16th birthday. There's nothing that the courts were going to do to uh, address that uh, based on our experience. So we do have three 15-year-olds there, but the majority actually, according to our data for last year, uh, dropped out at age 17. Uh, and then you see a couple that actually dropped out at 21. Unfortunately, um, time ran out on them. They didn't have enough credits to be able to finish by the time uh, they aged out, so to speak, but um, those are our dropouts by age. Our dropouts by race, uh, as far as a strict number, our largest number are white students, but uh, by percentage, our largest number of dropouts are our Hispanic population with 51 of the 151. A big factor in uh, dropping out, uh, is retentions. Uh, you actually see the zero on the left-hand side of this represents kindergarten. So there were two retentions in kindergartner, kindergarten out of these 151 dropouts. And the far right zero actually represents 30 students who were not retained at all. So out of this data, there were 125 retentions for our um, 151 dropouts. The majority of them were in the ninth grade. And then here are the reasons uh, 
that our students, uh, in some cases, they give us these reasons. In some cases, it's our student advocates who, uh, based on their notes and they're dealing with the student over time, uh, obviously uh, attendance and students not coming to school. And, you know, none of these are the single reason. Right. Almost all of these overlap. Obviously, if they're not there, then their academics are <laughs> going to suffer. Um, and they're not going to be engaged in that. Uh, some of them, 23 is the number for students who chose work or employment. In some of those cases, it's a matter they feel they have to and their families feel they have to work to support the family. While you're on the slide, you're talking about work being one of the, um, one of the top numbers of the reasons why. Um, would you say our choice academies are going to improve that number a whole lot more than it might, it might be another number, another reason. The numbers might go up and it might be another reason, but wouldn't you think the Choice Academy is going to help the work related? Yes, sir. I think that uh, the opportunities that we're giving students, the, the greater number of choices, whether it's academy or distance learning in other forms, uh, I think all of those are going to lead to a, a, a reduced dropout rate. As and and while I'm asking questions, Mr. Jones, and, and while you're here, I'm going to put you on the spot. But, um, I saw where Clayton went from 23 to 3. Mm -hmm. um, would you say the reason for that is relationships, building relationships and searching those students out and, and helping with the parents? Or what, what caused that number to go from 23 to 3? Uh, yes, sir. I, I would say, uh, and thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, it, it was a team effort uh, in terms of finding out each one of those. It's not just the numbers of students. And uh, we had a tremendous student advocate and a counseling staff who okay. went above and beyond and went and tracked people down uh, at work, uh, wherever they were, mm -hmm. and went and found lab addresses and found family members who, uh, that, that number actually was 34 at the beginning of the last school year, and she brought 11 back before the dropout number had to be reported. So that's why we went from 34 to 23. So she did a tremendous job just in lowering that number down. I guess that Ms. Melinda Whitley uh, was fantastic. But, I would say the reason why is we, we put a concerted effort into mm -hmm. creating uh, flexible opportunities for students even before the Choice Academy right. came on board and, and trying to really talk to each student and create a personalized graduation plan for each student uh, and wrap it around some supports in terms of teachers being willing to work at different levels. Uh, or even the academy was robust with students coming in and getting help in the afternoon <coughs> to recover credits that they had, had previously uh, not attained. And I think the biggest part was they just adopted the motto of all in and, and all in about their education. If there's right. a bunch of adults that are here all in for them, uh, then we were going to help coach them to success uh, versus. Where you actually say, I'm here to help you, not, you know, right. what what can I do for you to make this situation better? Yeah. So, and, and the three still were yeah. personal because uh, that was the three hurt uh, because we didn't we didn't want to see those three of them either. Right. Uh, it, it certainly was a team effort that. that Thank you. Very Thank you for sharing that. I just echo that. There's no doubt Clayton High School is one of the early adopters of some of the more innovative opportunities. So, uh, but I do. He uh, echoed his student advocate, but all our student advocates, our school social workers, it's nurses taking care of kids in the office to get them well so they'll be at school rather than be at home and, and having attendance issues. So it is a team effort. Any other questions? It says that 11 moved. I mean, what? They had chosen not to enroll wherever they ended up. Oh, we, so we, they, they left one of our schools. They left one of our schools. We anticipated that they would enroll right. at another school, but when we tried to verify I that, we verified that and we couldn't find them, uh, we knew they moved, but we don't know where they ended up, and so they are a dropout. Yes, sir. If a child goes, uh, starts homeschooling, are they considered dropout or not? No. Not good. They would not be. And uh, on, on our side of things, too, if a student enrolls and is there less than 20 days and moves again, they're considered transient, and they would not count against us. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Stott. Thanks for what you do. I like the beard, man. <laughs> I think you, Miss <laughs> Roberts, share it to somebody. <laughs> <laughs>
want to draw your attention to your Save the Date lists as well as the news. We're always in the news. Um, so just wanted to make sure you're, you're always very supportive and showing up in our schools and so you have a list of, of things coming up. Um, as you see, the school system will be closed. We'll have our buildings closed through the 27th. And we'll return back to work the staff on the 28th. But students will return after Friday on January the 3rd. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the planning board, I, I did go to the last planning board meeting. And, you know, I think there was only one subdivision to be a on the docket to be approved and it was approved and it was approved in the area where all four of the feeder schools were capped. So <laughs> it's, just an, it's just another conversation that we got to have as far as our growth plan for building schools and, and districts and those type things. That, that's a challenge we got as a board, but I still say we're blessed to live in a county that continues to grow. So um, our next board meeting is January the 9th, 2018 at 2 p.m. Mr. Dr. Renfro, you have any other things to offer? No, I just appreciate what uh, you all do as board members in supporting the uh, great things happening in our classrooms. Um, I wish you all a uh, very Merry Christmas, and uh, my prayer is that 2018 is the best one that we've ever had in the Johnston County Public Schools. Amen to that. Well, we're obviously going in the right direction. Thanks uh, to you. Absolutely. I entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Motion by Butler Hall. <laughs> Second by Todd Sutton. All those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? Meeting adjourned. Yes, sir, buddy. <laughs>